Hi everyone around the world and thank you. Welcome back to AMS Automotive Evolution. It's me, Christopher Ludwig. Exciting start here to another pack day uh, of, of, of forecasts, data, interviews, panels, looking at the transformation of the automotive manufacturing sector, driven, of course, in large part by electrification, by the push for sustainability, and by new opportunities in digitalization and automation. For those of you who had the chance to join us for some or all of the event yesterday, uh, I hope you found it insightful. We really covered the gamut there of, of, of changes from BMW uh, revamping its plant in Munich ahead of a new EV architecture and what that means for everything from body manufacturing to final assembly to digital twin simulation uh, of, of, the, of the factory environment. Um, it was a great insight there. We talked with the likes of Polestar about new supplier and partner relationships to help accelerate this transition. Um, there's keeping up with battery chemistry, working with new startups, uh, using digital twins even to bring customers onto the factory floor or closer to the production environment. Um, uh, so much interesting happening, as well as confronting uh, obvious risks and challenges that the industry is facing. Clearly, we know about that on the supply chain side. And when you look at areas like battery um, with rising inputs for minerals and materials uh, on top of a very ambitious launch uh, pace, which we'll be talking about more shortly, um, th th there are clearly some risks to, to, to those business plans and perhaps some shifts in business models that we'll start to see. Um, we, we, we heard from the likes of, of, of Scania, the likes of automotive cells company, a battery startup manufacturer, um, working with Mercedes, Benz, and, and Stellantis, just about how they're planning to mitigate that risk and address it through localization, different cell and pack design. So, so much at stake for manufacturing, but also so much opportunity, uh, which I think we had a chance to explore and will continue to do so over the next two days. Um, for anyone, firstly, who didn't get a chance to see any of our sessions live yesterday, they're now all available on our online event platform. Simply click to the agenda where you can click load previous sessions or navigate to the previous day, and you'll find the option to watch a recording. So you can do that at any point now, uh, at any point of the day. But of course, we have a packed agenda coming up over the next few hours. So we hope you'll, you'll tune into our, our live sessions. A bit more again, just to ensure you're making the best, the making the most of this online event and platform. You have the opportunity to to look through other delegates who are registered on the platform, express interest and connect with them, set up meetings or send messages, uh, and obviously engage in networking on or off the platform. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there's lots of resources in our virtual exhibitor booth area where you find uh, lots of different information about our sponsors and the opportunity to connect with them. Um, can't say it enough, they're there because they're offering technology services solutions to many of the challenges we're, we're, we're talking about in great detail uh, at this event. And as I said, we have a lot more ahead of us uh, today. We're shortly gonna be looking in depth at a forecast and analysis of the global automotive manufacturing industry, but some particular focus on North America, but, but looking at that transformation. Uh, we'll have sessions coming up afterwards on flexible automation, um, looking in detail as well at light weighting strategies, particularly in the context of EVs. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk more about what it takes to convert ICE factories to battery electric vehicle factories, the capital requirements, tooling, technology that's underpinning all of that. And finally, one of, one of the highlights when we close out the day later, for me, certainly a highlight, is we're talking with ZF's Arno Guloin, uh, who heads up the, the, the electrified powertrain operations about empowering people, upskilling, reskilling the workforce, and what, what the industry can do to, to keep people uh, excited and aligned with the changes coming ahead from different, different online training tools to agile working methods and a lot more besides that. So lots ahead of us, um, but, but, but in the first instance, we have a very exciting hour with you and, and I'm, I'm happy to welcome uh, our first speaker, uh, Joe McCabe from Auto Forecast Solutions, who's going to be giving us an outline of, of, the, of, the, of the industry's transformation and changes uh, from a forecasting point of view. Auto Forecasting Solution is one of the premier 
um, forecasters in, in the industry has done a lot of in, input, not only on the semiconductor side, but also on EV platforms and much more of the side. So I want to hand it over to Joe. Joe, thanks so much for joining us at, at this event. It's great to see you again and have you here. I know you've got a, you've got a, a deck full of data for our audience, so I'm going to hand it over to you and we'll pick up some questions right at the end. Uh, thank you, Chris. And thank you, everyone, again. Uh, really love this venue. Lots of uh, information, as Chris said, about the entire the holistic view of the automotive space. Uh, I'm going to uh, start soon. I just want to drive into there's going to be a lot of content on these slides. If we need a copy afterwards, uh, please either reach out to me or your or your contact at AMS and 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 get a copy. But we're going to really dive into the whole global story first. I like to dive in a little bit who we are, what we do. I'm Joe McCabe. I'm president and CEO of Auto Forecast Solutions. We forecast every the production of every single vehicle built worldwide for the next eight years. Who builds it, where, when, and how many? This data is updated on a monthly basis. In fact, every week we tell our clients what's coming so they don't have to wait to the end of the month to really change their business plans and see how volatile this industry is. We've been doing a weekly analysis of the semiconductor impact since July of 2021, detailing every vehicle that's been impacted and then uh, quantifying if they are if it's recoverable, recoverable volume or not and a slew of other ways. We also have a, a bunch of uh, a, a proprietary software which has zero competition in the industry. Our own planning software to put your part numbers against for revenue planning, portfolio tool for market share analysis, and our scenario tool to let you actually manipulate the volumes yourself for different market conditions. But most importantly, I've been doing this for 25 years. All my team leads have been doing this for 25 years, working together in the same industry together. Our support is included. If you need to know the so what, the why behind it, what the data means, what the data is not telling you, that's where our real value add is, really helping you navigate, you know, potentially lofty RFQ targets you're seeing or changing business that we're seeing in this migration from ICs and EVs. You know, we talk about forecasting. It's a lot more than just the numbers. Yes, there's empirical data, but there's also subjective and objective issues that have to go into the story. We have to look at things like shareholder value. Most vehicle manufacturers are publicly held companies. Therefore, at the end of the day, they have one audience to serve. Everyone else is second, the shareholder. And as long as shareholder value is improved, then they're doing the right job. We've seen it with the Tesla model with very little profitability in the first 10 years of existence. And now they're the largest company out there by a factor of 10 in the vehicle manufacturing space. We see others investing in, in electrification and just the sheer investment in that electrification is helping Wall Street and the shareholder community. Everyone else is second. It's an important uh, thing to take because it's really transforming the manufacturing space. We're a very untraditional way of manufacturing. We're going to dive into that in a second. But we have to take things such as the importance of the supply chain, more reliance on getting to market faster, having the, the first EV in a space or having a, a world class product or having a lot less recalls going forward, really leveraging the expertise of the supplier base to bring their best game uh, to the table. We have to look at geopolitical issues. Obviously, we're going with the, with the Russia Ukraine issue, with with all everything going on uh, financially in both our domestic market in North America as well as globally. But we also have to look at how do we balance things. You know, how do you basically say, look, there's a new initiative out there, but we all can't just run that direction. There's a lot of consumers, a lot of different markets out there. We're not all first world countries able to potentially invest fifty thousand dollars in EVs. We're looking for a global scale of transformation, yet different consumers in that mix. So how do we really educate and help guide our customers, our suppliers, our jurisdictions, our vehicle manufacturers in a way that gets them around here for 5, 10, 50 years of existence? And that's the type of thing that has to go into forecast, not just piling in a bunch of numbers. If you're basically taking all of your business plans or your RFQs and adding them up, that's a dangerous top. That's a dangerous plan because the market will be 40 percent higher than reality. This was in a case pre-EV and is even more of a case in a EV uh, focused world. So we're going to dive into all that. And I do want to give a little overview of our last semiconductor report. This one went out last this past Monday. As I said, we go down deep, deep dive into our, our customers, get all the detail of every single vehicle and the unique volume impact and then identify if it's recoverable or not recoverable. But since the beginning of tracking, uh, about 12 and a quarter million units have been impacted production wise at the manufacturing level. Now, since we're a forecasting company, as I said, we don't just add up everyone's business plans. It really equated to about 6.6 .6 million units of lost production. 
Not all vehicles were lost that were impacted. For example, in North America, large trucks, large SUV are the bread and butter of the Detroit Three. Therefore, the idea when the chips come in, they were at they were uh, they were put into those vehicles. We're all seeing a lot of creativity in manufacturing, decontenting vehicles, taking up uh, heated seat, taking out Bluetooth, taking out certain things that will allow that vehicle to get to the consumer faster. That is a non-safety related chip uh, product. The total impact, since we're a forecasting company, we're not done yet, is approaching 13 million units since we started as tracking in January of 21. Just this year, we're talking about nearly 2 million units of impacted volume that are announced, as well as nearly 2.5 million of forecasted. So another half million on top of that, or excuse me, there are 750,000 units on top of that, of forecasted volume that has not been announced yet. It's impacted these 435 plants on a global basis. And again, on a weekly level, we do this. Unfortunately, in North America and Europe are fighting for first place for a very unfortunate race. If you look on the right hand side, they're basically you see the charts of our total potential, our total announced and our total loss. And you'll see, like I said, North America, 2.3 million lost, 2.2 million lost in Europe and obviously the, the larger of them. On the left hand side, basically, we're looking at the current market. This year, the worst impacted is definitely Europe with lots of cases that are being hit, piling on things like Ukraine and Russia and things of that nature. So they have the most of unrecoverable as well as forecasted going out as of this point. Unrecoverable, but our, our standpoint basically says if anything shut down for more than 15 days, that's putting in a really difficult position. So then we have to segment those into either at risk or completely unrecoverable. And we go do that by vehicle by vehicle and, and, and guide our customers with that analysis. So, yes, we told Chris said we're talking about a North America conversation, but you can't look at North America automotive in a vacuum. We all compete in a global space. So I'm going to tell a global story. We're going to talk about North America, obviously, in detail. We're going to dive deep into the electrification outlook as well. If we look at North America right now at the bottom. I use this graph because in 16 and 17, it was a high watermark for the whole world. And then we look at basically coming in 19 into 20. So 20 starting at pandemic level, 21 still in it, 22 still in. It. So we are basically calling for recovery that's going to hit probably late, late Q4 at best into Q1 of next year. And when I say I say recovery, it's not just the fact that magically there's going to be all these chips available. It's the combination of availability of chips and the creativity of manufacturing, like I said, of decontent those vehicles to get vehicles in the consumer's hands faster. So it's not going to be a light switch moment that all of a sudden we have all the chips in line. It's going to be a very long, drawn, painful process. If you look at the forecast level of North America, yes, we did 17.8 million units in 16, but we don't believe that's going to be our future. This idea of, build, of, of a build where you sell mentality is important. So we don't build small cars to offset the former cafe calculation here. We still build the vehicles that are sold here. So what's going to happen is you're going to see better utilization capacity that a solid North America is really a high 16, mid 17, low to mid 17 number in perpetuity. We think that is strength in the market. And that's going to be an important conversation we're going to have very soon about the idea of volume impact as we ship into it shift into new products. A, a very interesting story here is China. In 2019, China built nearly 24 and a half million light vehicles. And we all were going through the whole pain of COVID. Yet, if you look at 21, they built more in 2021 in the center of COVID than they did in 19 pre-COVID. So it really talks to the fact that not all jurisdictions play by the same playbook. Manufacturers that want to take a leadership role or countries like China who want to be global dominant in this have are finding a way through the pain. And so it's a really important fact that it's not a rising tide raises all boats kind of conversation. There's a lot of pain the whole way, but China's the only one that seems to be in some sort of really fast recovery mode. The one million unit club talks the conversation of who is your current customer, but who should be your next customer? The idea of a million units of brand owners. So think of Volkswagen as a brand owner. It does, Volkswagen doesn't build in China. Their joint ventures do. So if I look up Volkswagen in our data set by vehicle manufacturer, I'll lose the China influence. But if I look at my brand owner, I'll see any manufacturer, joint venture, or otherwise that are building their branded vehicles, their Volkswagens, their Audis, their Porsches. So this means they have a lot of buying power and a lot of influence over their suppliers if they can do a million units per year. And the usual suspects bubble to the surface, Toyota, Volkswagen, et cetera. These should be the customers you're talking to. What I'm look, focused more on is the bottom of the list, the Tatas, the Cheeries, the Suzuki's, the Great Walls. Asian-based manufacturers 
that have a significant amount of buying power and therefore a significant amount of influence on suppliers to get better pricing, move to just-in-time production, the whole, the whole supply chain lined up. And if you're not working with these customers now, they will be the next customer for front. And if you're not talking to them, your competition is. So the underlying theme we have here is always being proactive in your, in your, uh, your approach to the business. Understanding where we are now, understand those targets we're going to go in, but really understanding where are these new up and comers and are you talking to them? Because a lot of these manufacturers want a North America footprint. They just don't have one yet. And they're going to need the guidance of a North America based supplier or a global supplier that's heavy in North America to really guide them. And that guiding supplier is going to be the one that's potentially going to win in the long run. If you look at the right hand side, you know, you look at the list of the inductees since 2012, but also the silver, right? Under about between 500 a million units per year, Beijing, BYD, Dongfang, GAC. Again, all Chinese, Asian based manufacturers all looking to expand out of their markets. Now, North America. This slide breaks it up into the major jurisdictions of North America. We look at US, Canada, and Mexico. We do have some growth. Again, if we use 2016 as our anchor of high watermark, we do not see the us getting back to 17.8, nor the necessity to get back to 17.8. So if you're a volume-based supplier, which most suppliers are, we're going to talk about this some more, there's really this awakening issue of how do I reconfigure my business so maybe volume is not the only way, maybe value is. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So uh, yeah, I, I, obviously these are the trends we like to see, and, and, and we see a growth, like I said, in 22 and 23 coming out of it. Uh, if you look at 16 as the high water mark and 20 is our la last bottom, you, you, you see the growth and the, uh, the company analyzed growth rates on the right hand side. Uh, there's a little typo there, excuse me about that. But Canada, unfortunately, is usually always taking last place in terms of investment. A lot of times Canada will have some investment made by a, a, a traditional legacy manufacturer, but then something taken away. So a net sum zero. Inger, GM's Ingersoll plant goes from 300,000 Equinoxes to 30,000 Bright Drops. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Canada is really refocusing themselves. They really want to be the Silicon Valley of the North. They're really focusing on how can we be a, an electrification epicenter globally that people want to come and work with us. They have materials. They have a centralized manufacturing location. They have top supplier, global suppliers located there. We think of Ontario. We think of Canada as one-tenth the population of the United States, but we think even further concentrated as Ontario being the true epicenter of their manufacturing. They have a very strong government pushing electrification. We saw a new investment in Windsor from, from Stellantis. We see this really good movement, and we do expect to see non-traditional players, non-D3 and non-Toyota you know, Toyota and Honda looking at Canada seriously. What's going to happen in the future is you're going to have a market that is less of a manufacturer puts a plant in and all the suppliers build around it to a jurisdiction has an EV epicenter with raw materials, battery operations, all the things, and then people will come to it. So it's really changing the mix on how, how things are going on. And yes, COVID, semiconductor, raw material issues, global conflict, you know, on top of USMCA things, which aren't even being talked about anymore because we're all going through this pain of, of manufacturing. Now, if we look at North America a little different light, we say, well, let's look at those brand owners again. And our brand owners say Detroit 3, European-based manufacturers, Asia-based manufacturers are all staying in their lane. So if you're heavily weighted, if you're a Koretsu type of supplier, great. If you're more of a Detroit 3 supplier, great. They're all staying in their lane. However, if you flip the narrative to an electrification perspective, we go from 14% of North America was building electrified vehicles, meaning BEVs and hybrids. We detailed the hybrids different, um, plug-in hybrids and, and more granular, uh, but this is basically just giving a highlight story. And then we go from a three-fold increase by 29. And we're considered conservative. I mean, the idea is that we are not just mashing together OEM business plans. No self-respecting manufacturer is going to tell their supplier less than 150,000 EVs a year because shareholders love the story. But again, in, in, in forecasting, not everyone wins. There's always a, a, a balancing act. There's always so much of a piece of pie to go around and everyone's getting looking for a slice. But it's really important about looking at your product portfolio and the sheer migration and massive amount of growth. We live in a global uh, glacial market. Automotive is not traditionally a fast moving market. Supplier, vehicle manufacturer planning vehicles to be built three years from today. And they're just lining their, their suppliers up now. That vehicle will be around for five years. So now you're talking about an eight year cycle. Uh, this is not iPhones we're reinventing every year. These are large 
machines that need to keep people safe. They need to be they stylish. They need to fit into a consumer's need and in their budget. And it's really, uh, it's for me, a forecasting to have this hockey stick growth of 14% to 46%. It's a tough pill to swallow. Unfortunately, that is the direction we're moving in. Now, when we look at North America, it's not just about knowing who is here. Forecasting is really about understanding where you are now, protecting yourself, looking at your short-term window, but also looking at your long-term window, all things that we provide. We, this is the short list of customers that are or looking or are here in North America that you're not your customers, you should be paying attention to them. And they all have different strategies. GAC, uh, you know, several years ago was relegated to the concourse outside in, in the uh, Detroit Auto Show. Just two short years ago, three short years ago, pre-COVID, they own the entire center floor, center stage of the auto show. Really bringing in high quality vehicles in North America. Uh, they have a huge relationship with Stellantis in, in uh, North America. In fact, they're bringing in Dodge-based vehicles uh, excuse me, uh, GAC built vehicles into into Mexico, badging as Dodges, and then going to sell them locally to that domestic market. To us, that's the first step of many to say, how can we prove to people that a Chinese built vehicle in North America is uh, a viable product and how can we expand that? Cherry has been trying very hard to build a a a in import strategy, had a little uh, uh, some pitfalls and some hiccups in the whole way, but they're not going to give up on it. BYD, two words, Warren Buffett. Just two short months ago, BYD said globally we're going all EV and bang, they're turning off their ICs and they're going all EV. First step of many. But Warren Buffett back product into North America, just him behind it, behind it could really launch BYD to the front list of the North American investment. Geely. I know we have some audience here, right? We have Link, we have Polestar, we have Lincoln Co., owner of Volvo, using an ownership strategy. We're talking to these manufacturers and they're doing very well. They're keeping arm's length and saying, look, stay in your lane, Volvo. Stay in your lane, Lois. These are things that you are good at, but we're going to learn the whole way. And we're going to leverage everything, all the positives from those relationships into building these new Lincoln Co. and Polestar brands. So really strong business model. SAIC is everywhere but North America. They're surrounding North America, so they're coming. And VinFast. You know, the entry part of VinFast is you're talking about a 2 to $4 billion investment in North Carolina. A Vietnamese-based automotive company has never built an electric vehicle to date. All of a sudden, is going to make a significant mess in North America, build an EV, trying to try, you know, playing around with the battery swapping technologies. And honestly, with our, cons our current consumers, might have some real market strength because the emotional buyer out there. So this has never been heard of before where someone comes out of nowhere and all of a sudden has a substantial place in this business because they're playing in an EV space. There's a lot less parts, no EPA requirements because there is no emissions, no powertrains to worry about, a lot of, of benefits for new EV players, but then risks for legacy players that need to continue to compete. And a handful of all the electrified players, Arrival, Zooks, Lucid, Rivian, right? And Foxconn, pay attention to Foxconn. We're talking about Foxconn that basically took over Lordstown facility, going to build the, the endurance. They're going to build uh, a contract mo mobility and harmony. If you haven't looked it up, look it up. Platform, because they want to own the software and they want to commonize. They want to make the platform sort of a commodity and then build different contract manufacturing. We think contract manufacturing a huge play going forward. You got to pay attention to. So really pay to pay attention to Foxconn. And look. I have no proof on it, but as a forecaster, if Foxconn is building the Fisker pair and they also are a major supplier to Apple, I'm not saying that they're going to build the next Apple product vehicle when it comes out, but putting those two fruits together, hey, who knows? You know, the pair and the Apple might be a, a little uh, foreshadowing of what's coming. Okay, China. You can't talk about North uh, production without talking about China. But China, I'm going to talk about in a different light. I'm going to talk about this lesson of disruption. In 2010, China was the size of North America. In seven short years, 10 million units larger. They took advantage of a bottom, the global recession, and took that right to the moon. So this is possible. And the next one is, if we're at our bottom now, we're coming out of this COVID issue, what are we going to say 10 years from now or seven years from now about who the new leader is? Is it a country? Is it a manufacturer you've never heard of? So really got to pay attention to that. This idea is proven out that disruption does help if you take the proactive approach. Now, 
a lot of it is subsidized by the, Ch the Chinese government. So when they took the subsidy away from the consumers in 18 and 19 dropped. But again, we have 30 million units of production. Now, China does not want to build in China export in perpetuity. They want to be global dominant players and therefore they're going to continue to plant their flag elsewhere all over the world. Unfortunately, what you're looking at is 106 different vehicle manufacturers in China in 17 at high water mark. That sort of drops a little bit, but still over 100 vehicle manufacturers, 100, you know, 104 GMs. Uh, that's a, I don't know if the Chinese government is going to support all of them. It's probably going to force some of the smaller players to get together. But 90 different brand owners, they've got 90 different Volkswagens in one region. We do think the Chinese government is going to have more and more influence like they do now. and going to force the players that make 25000 a year to become 50000 a year and, join, and get together. So the volume is going to increase, but the number of players may decrease. So really pay attention to your mix. Okay, electrification. So why electrification, right? Uh, you know, the idea behind electrification is, yes, we know all the hurdles and we're going to talk about the hurdles, range and cost and things of that nature. Uh, we're not anti-electrification in the slightest, but we have to be realistic with the market and with our customers on how they do their planning. And one of the driving factors is affordability and not just the fact that things are getting cheaper. They're not. A lot more on the left hand side is getting financed. And a lot more is getting fine, a, a lot more getting finance over a longer period of time. So when we talk about affordability, it's really not there. It's just the fact that the newer consumers are willing to spend more money over a longer period of time and therefore sort of shelter the fact of how expensive these vehicles are. I mean, case in point, right? I cut my cable line, assuming I'm going to make some, I'm going to save some money. And I went off and got a new subscription service and I have 14 different other $5 services a month that frankly, are probably more than I was paying a cable. But it's the idea of sp spreading out payments over longer terms and finding ways to make it on a smokescreen sort of affordable to a consumer. This is what's going to help drive $50,000, $60,000 electric vehicles. Uh, I'm not saying everyone's going to buy them because of it, but we're not seeing any kind of trend in financing dropping or the terms. When you talk about 72-month terms as an average I mean, there are 84s and 96s out there in terms of monthly, uh, in terms of monthly financing, massive amount of number of uh, uh, financing numbers, which is, again, if you're a conservative consumer, difficult to swallow. So let's drive into electrification. Let's first look at the global space and let's look at it from an XEV, all the electrified products. So I took around out the noise, let's call it, of any internal combustion vehicle in here. So all the forecast that we do, every vehicle built worldwide, we also break it down their powertrain components, their engines, their transmission, electric motors. And if anything of those changes, then we have to have a different forecast, meaning if an inline four is married to an automatic transmission or a manual, that's two different packages on a vehicle that we have to manage that have to sum up to the vehicle build. So Chev is standard hybrid. We didn't want to use F for full hybrid because it gets in the way of fuel cells. PHEV is plug-in hybrid. Obviously, BEV is battery electric vehicle. And uh, the, the percentage of the blue line is the penetration rate of battery electric vehicles. Now, if you look at this market, one of every five vehicles built in 2029, our forecast, is full battery electric. It's a lot of vehicles. But if you dive deeper into the into the graphics, you see that standard hybrids stay in their lane. We think there's still a huge market because of that consumer that is not all in on BEVs. And plug-in hybrids actually stay really uh, tempered. And that's because if you're going to make an investment in a plug-in hybrid, you're not too far away from the BEV investment. So this idea of stair-stepping into st standard hybrids, to plug-in hybrids, and BEVs, we're seeing more of a IC to BEV and a hybrid, standard hybrid to BEV mix. And this is where we see the growth. By 2025, BEVs will double standard hybrid production globally. Now, again, these will, if you look at and sign, line up all the business plans, the business plans are much higher than this, is much more realistic view that we believe of the world. But if you look at the right-hand side, that makes 126 million vehicles that are battery electric on the, on the, on the um, road that have to have infrastructure. Again, that infrastructure does not exist right now globally. There's not enough lithium in the world to support that many vehicles. So we believe there is more coming. There's more, there's different battery, battery chemistries coming. There's more creativity coming. There's more ways of saying how they're going to move this needle. I can't believe we're at the end of innovation for electrification. 
We're at the start of it where lithium is the major player, but we're going to find the reduction in nickel, the reduction in cobalt, right? For geopolitical and, 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 and you know, and personal reason, obviously, you know, labor and things like that. But we're going to really see a mix. And the only way we're going to get these numbers is really seeing that constant innovation push to get these car prices down at a reasonable place for the consumer so they're out in their hands and we can hit these numbers. If we look at North America, everyone says North America's behind. We're not. One out of every four vehicles in 2029 is slated to be produced as a battery electric vehicle. Unfortunately, that puts 24.8 million units collectively by then on the road. Again, same broken record here. That infrastructure does not exist today. And not enough lithium in the world to support that in terms of North America, let alone the world. Now, what's happening is we're seeing more stick than carrot. We're seeing that uh, electrification is a governmental an environmental push. It is not a consumer push, different from different different than the, uh, the traditional automotive space. So when you see that 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 CAF A uh, penalties are tripling, we are forcing vehicle manufacturers to get into this lane of production. So to get to these numbers, you got to get to like 30 or 35 percent EV share by 30. We don't think we're going to get there. That's a lot of volume to go, and because we're going to have diminishing returns once we get to one and one every four vehicles fully electrified. But again, you got to really pay attention. What is driving this issue? Is it consumer's desire or is it more of a, hey, we're trying to mandate a carbon footprint, save the world one vehicle time. Again, not against electrification, but it's, it's a very difficult pill to swallow when you have a field of dreams approach that you're building a vehicle and you're forcing consumer, they have to make a switch. In terms of European production, same story. One of every, let's say, uh, uh, four to three, three to four vehicles, fully electric by 2029. Not a lot of plug-in hybrids there. They're making the leap. And that puts 35 million cumulative vehicles, BEVs, on the road. Again, infrastructure. China, one of every four vehicles. Now, you might say, well, Europe was 28%. China's only 25%. But law of large numbers, 25% of a big number is a big number. Right. So you're talking about 57 million BEVs to support on the road as a cumulative count. Right. You're seeing this massive 20 to 21 growth because that's when China said, yep, we're all in. The only way we're going to be global dominant is we're going to bring a, a really high end, high quality electric vehicle to all the markets outside. We've been already learning from all the uh, our European partners in the last couple of decades because we they had to partner to come into China. And now we're going to we're going to grow out. Uh, global Ford brand owner, you know, Ford still has a global presence, still has some some European presence. So one out of every three vehicles Ford is planning on building in 29 in our forecast, mind you, fully electric puts over seven million Ford branded vehicles on the road in that time frame. GM brand owner, not a lot of European at all manufacturing more. That's why their numbers a little different, but it's mostly a China and a North America push. So one out of every five vehicles for North uh, for GM globally, fully electric, 6 million units on the road. Stellantis, one out of every four, right in the middle of Ford and GM. Uh, you know, Stellantis goes from FCA by itself being the worst carbon offender, having to buy their Tesla credits to get to where they got, uh, get to where they need to be helping Tesla at the same time grow to uh, merging with PSA, becoming Stellantis, becoming a global force to be reckoned with electrification. This is how fast this market's moving. 11 million units of their branded vehicles on the road by 29. Okay, so let's start caging the North America BEV market. Now, when we started this conversation 28 minutes ago, you know, the idea was, hey, what's the next six to 12 months look like? And that's important, right? Because, but we're really looking at is the next six to 12 months is going to really dictate what the next six to 12 years is going to look like, because hopefully we're out of this COVID pain. Hopefully we have a chip issue. Yes, there's going to be some other issue that's going to happen. There's going to be some other raw material shortage. God forbid it's going to be other some other pandemic or uh, related issue or, or catastrophic issue that's going to happen. It, it's unfortunate because we all live in this global integrated space. Um, but we got to take all that into consideration and say, yes, understanding what's happening now is really going to affect what's going on in your future. But a little history lesson. In 2019, there was only seven fully electric vehicles on the road in North America. By 29, 107, right? So 10 years, we're adding 100 new nameplates, and everyone assumes, well, Tesla's going to be the global leader all the time. It's tough to be, the, it's good would be a global leader when you're the only player. 
it's a little more difficult when there's another uh, there's hundreds of more competitors right knocking on your door for that same that same consumer same time frame in 2019 there's only three brands pushing electric vehicles in north america chevy nissan and tesla 37 different brands doing nearly 5 million bevs in 10 short years later and two of those years are two or three years that have a COVID impact so yes there's hockey stick not always fans of hockey stick but this is where the growth is you can tell any story you want depending on how you make your graphic right so uh, but that and that growth of bev production and new entrance is really going to change the market dynamic going forward if you look at key electrified platforms just in north america left hand side of the legacy players right hand side is north america by itself excuse me new players by itself uh, GM uh, B, BV1 going down the contract manufacturing phase. We believe uh, leveraging electrification in the commercial vehicle space is an important one because they can sell larger pieces of them to fleets. They can get better optics to the consumer, seeing an Amazon truck zipping around saying, hey, that's pretty cool. It's electric. So getting the optics and the consumer more invested in electrification. And uh, so that's what's going to happen with Bright Drop. Their underpinnings are going to be a, a, for a commercial vehicle van. And they're going to basically go out and find new players to fill. So they're going to take the Ingersoll plant, which was, again, capable of doing 300,000 Equinox a year. Currently on target to do about 30,000 bright drops. But as they get more contracts, they're going to fill that capacity. So GM may have three, four, five different customers they're building for under one roof using their skateboard design. We think this idea is going to be really important going to the future, trying to fill capacity using partnerships, collaboration and so on the bev3 platform is their global platform that's going to be fully you know really coming out this year for their lyric and their celestique their cadillac electrified products their their blazer is going to be electrified their equinox is going to be electrified their buick variants and even the cruise brand under this new global platform is going to be electrified underpinnings the but and bet the hummer right so think about this and this is where their money makers are right the Tahoe's, the silverados the escalade but think about how the optics again are taking probably the one of the worst offending vehicles of terms of EPA, the Hummer uh, on the road and transform that whole brand into a thousand horsepower green machine, right? So we're changing how brand uh, uh, brands are looked at. We're really trying to revitalize GM trying to take their Cadillac brand that had a more of a, a mature market consumer and they're trying to make it into a youthful consumer by pushing more electrified. So we're really going to see this real mix. So, you know, using yesterday's, views of the market and, and products is difficult for moving forward for in, into the future. Uh, Ford with their program with the Lightning being one of the first electrified products out there uh, in terms of trucks. The current one is a, a reconfigured Ford Lightning uh, uh, F-Series. The next one's going to be a complete underpinning in 25. Stellantis uh, platforms, the small, medium, large, and frame platforms that Stellantis is pushing, uh, electrified platforms. On the right-hand side, these dates are fluid because of COVID, because of chips, because of just difficulty, right? Rivian already said, hey, we're having difficulty, but we're still going to stay on, on par for our 25,000 units per year. They've only done about 2,000 a date. So they they're, they're have a lot of ramping coming out, but a good product. Lucid, high-end product, you know, over 100,000, but cool product to pay attention to. Uh, Amazon, Arrival, Foxconn, you know, with, with their Fisker relationship and now with their new expanded relationship with the new with Lordstown Motor in Lordstown, Ohio. But again, these data, dates are fluid, but they're all viable products into the market con, 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 uh, competing for a new consumer. Now, let's look at North America from a BEV perspective. But let's look at those from a building more than 100,000 BEVs by 29. And the second slide is going to be building less than 100,000, the boutiques, let's call them. Now, I'm probably the first man, uh, forecaster to show you Honda beating Tesla in 2029. Tesla, we feel, is going to stay in their lane. Tesla is going to fill every, like, a full capacity of every plant they build. But right now, we're talking about they have three, four, five products in this window of 29. Going as other manufacturers, they'll have dozens of products with an established global presence of manufacturing and suppliers and distribution. So it's got to be that got to be really looked at when you look at Tesla. Yes, they're going to be a global leader. I don't think Tesla needs to do 10 or 20 million units of cars a year. They can do their two and three and still be the leader because now they're legacy. They're, they have built an Apple ecosystem to their model. But we see Honda actually taking it. And what's really interesting is two factors. Number one, Honda doesn't get fully electrified in, in, to, in North America until 2025. So four short years later. 
they're full. They're, they they take top top bid in North America. Number two, if you look at the portfolio mix on the right hand side, Honda goes to 49% of their portfolio fully electric by 29. That's a substantial move. And when you look at their mix and you compete against the Teslas, because Tesla's outside North America is a larger footprint than their North America footprint, right? Um, you see these growth paths. You see GM going from 3% to 27%, Ford 5% to 26%. Massive amount of uh, push into their portfolio for, for full electrification. So, yeah, there's going to be a, a constant horse race about who's in the front leader. Doesn't mean you always have to be working with the person in the front, but you got to be worried. You got to be working with all of them and pay attention to their market because this this chart could change next month depending on on strategy or wins or losses that might come into their market. If you look at the more boutique ones under 100,000 units per year, Foxconn, Renault, but again, Lucid, Vinfast, Canoe, Faraday, manufacturers that never didn't exist potentially a little a few months ago, if not a few years ago. Uh, all of a sudden have a footprint in North America and are feeding into a new type of consumer. Now, we all know the easy adoption issues, right? There's only four. It's really easy. Range, anxiety, infrastructure, resource limitation, cost barriers. That's great. All we got to do is knock one of these out. We're 25% closer to our, our, our reality of EVs all over the world. But there's a lot of fine print. There's a lot of issues of government and volume, whether it's going to be helpful or hurtful. There's going to be issues of how vehicle manufacturers may realign their supply chains. Will they potentially go more vertical so they're not left holding no lithium or no chips in the, in, in the future? How do you incentivize consumer or penalize a vehicle manufacturer in a healthy way that lets these public companies make money and still push their product? This is a difficult balance we're going to have to play with. Materials, I'm telling you, there's not enough lithium in the world to get what we need to get to. So, and an altered revenue model, this idea of looking at a subscription-based model, I'm not talking about sharing a vehicle, I'm talking about being in a consumer's wallet every single month. Tesla does it with the $199 uh, autonomous vehicle feature. If you want it this month, you pay 200 bucks and you have it. So we're going to see more and more of that idea coming forward. Now, this is what keeps people up at night and keeps us in business because there's such a disparate view of the electrification space, depending on who you are. We are the dark blue, the legacy players in dark blue, uh, the GMs and the Fords electrification, the light blue are the new player. The greens are their business plans, right? 50% greater than reality. And then you layer in the optimists and the futurists and the economic views that say, hey, we're going to basically take a ruler, take two points, give 12% growth every month, and bang, we're going to have fully electrified by 2029. So a lot of different shotgun blast views. 20 million BEVs in our forecast, but 30 over 38 million have been announced in that time frame. And the optimists are pushing 50 million. But even if the optimists are right, half the vehicles still need an internal combustion engine in 29. So if you're in the internal combustion engine business, it's not time to pack up yet. There's still a lot, a lot of long road ahead of you. Yes, you're going to have to look at your business plans and reconfigure and how you can manufacture and play in this new world. But it's not going to be this light switch moment that all of a sudden you don't hear, you wake up one morning and you don't hear nothing because everyone's zipping around electric vehicles. Okay, so if we look at a reality statement again, globally here are the top 10 countries building electrification. The scale of both of these charts is equal. China by itself on the left, two through 10 summed on the right. So obviously with not with the China impact, there's not a lot, a lot of electrification out there. OK, I mean, there is a lot in, in scope of things, but you're talking about they are truly way out in front in their electrification strategy. And that electrification strategy and the idea is not about smog reduction. It's about fuel independence and not having to buy anyone else's fuel. They want to make their own electricity. So, yes, the idea of, of, of cleaning the environment is good. We think that's really second into their into their initiatives. Primary is the idea of how to become global dominant in this and how we how we have a kind of energy independence where we can do our everything internal because we're spending way too much money subsidizing fuel for our consumers that we're importing. If you look at a mix by major market, North America, Europe, and China broken out, look, North America, like I said, is, is actually doing really well in terms of penetration rates of BEVs and hybrids. Again, as I said earlier, China, you know, half of it's going to, is, is looking at this idea of electrification, but it's just a massive market. 30 million units. It's difficult to electrify all of them. So yes, their massive, their percentages might be a little different, but their volumes uh, are greatly larger than everyone else. If you look at the top 10 brand owners in North America, 19 anchor, full year of actuals, 
and last year of, of a pre-pandemic. Tesla was at the top of 365. If you look in 29, te uh, Renault is last on the list at double those volumes. Growth, massive growth. So you're talking about this idea of moving from the left and the right in 10 short years. The real takeaway here is about the 10 top 10 brand owners is the stars on the right hand side. The stars on the right hand side are the players that weren't in the top 10 just short 10 short years earlier. Stellantis, Ford, GM, Honda were not on are not on the left hand side. Okay? And all of them have massive growth. So it's this idea of throwing tens of billions of dollars into these dedicated vehicle platforms, really changing it and really making it difficult for suppliers to say, now what? How do I retool my entire business model for a window of maybe one or two cycles of programs that are coming? Very difficult model. And even with the top down the right hand side, still 20 of 20 million units, still another five and a half million units that are in not the top 10. But the interesting part is rising tide raises all boats. In 2019, 71% of all the electrified production was going to these top 10, a lot less volume. Same thing on 29, 72% in the same range. So still a significant volume, but it's not that the market gets bigger and the top 10 players are global, keep on getting global dominance. This idea of everything's growing at a similar pace, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Okay, so if we took our, our production scenario real quick, this is our long-term view. The long-term view is we can get you to 50% total BEV production by 2040. We can't get you to the 90, right? There's too many markets out there that aren't going to consume these bioelectric vehicles. It's very easy to look at from a first world perspective. It's more difficult to look at for markets like Africa and, and Mexico and, and different places that aren't going to all of a sudden go by, by BEVs. A lot of consumers in these markets. And the best case is that all of the tens of billions of dollars get completely, uh, you know, the consumers are all in. They love it. Uh, commercial vehicles help build the market. And government involvement is 100% positive, which we know probably not one, two, or these three things are going to happen perfectly. We see the base case, a more conservative approach. The Toyota Mazda Honda model, where you basically say, yes, we're going to see investment, but it's going to be over long term. We're going to look at everything, including fuel cells. We're going to look at our how we're going to be here for 100 years, not 10 years. So this methodical approach is, I think, the more logical one. Still, 50% by 2040 puts 50 million per year BEVs produced. Tough pill, again, for us to swallow, but that's where the target's going. If you look at BEV sales in the United States only, what's going to happen is that, yeah, we have a significant uptick in sales. But the issue is you have to have a healthier mix of entry-level vehicles. It can't be all $100,000 cars. So you have to have this really healthy balance. Now, luxury in this case can be anything, you know, could be in the 60, 70,000 market, right? You need something that's going to be in that 35, 40, 45,000 hour range to get the consumers to bite. But this is how we're going to get there, this healthy balance of luxury and entry point vehicles. Okay, so the global imperative, we're going to have a couple more slides and we're done. We can open up some questions. But again, looking at the anchor of 19, the top 10 global vehicle platforms, not just the manufacturers, but the platforms. MQB was at the top at 7 million units, making up nearly 8% of total production worldwide. Then you have TNGA, Toyota, you have Honda on there, you have Hyundai a couple times, you have BMW, right? So healthy mix, again, majority of that vehicle production coming out of the Asia Pacific market. But if we fast forward to 2029, different story. We still have the Toyota and Volkswagen at the top of the list. But if we look at it from an electrification perspective, yes, there's a significant amount of electrification on some of these platforms, but very few platforms, not all of them. In fact, MEB is the only one that's 100% electric on the top 10. Next in line would be Stellantis with 68% of it really fully electric. Fully electric. Uh, but not all of them have 100% BEV. So we try to tell our supplier community, again, there's still a lot of healthy mix of non-BEV, yes, electrified, but vehicles that need traditional powertrains and ways of going to market. And we're really, that's why we monitor this on a monthly basis and help our clients really navigate where those are coming from. So my final slide basically says, the changing landscape is, is really volatile. We can all attest to that. And what we got to do is we got to look at current methodologies, but we have to understand what happened in the past, today, and what's going on in the future. So what's happening is there's a changing consumer out there. Brand loyalty has eroded. Very few people bleed BMW or Ford or Chevy blood through and through, right? People are emotionally, a new consumer has an emotional buying. 
their influence, whether it's a TikToker, I know we joke about it, but it's real, that's driving around with something they've never uh, seen before. But we're finding consumers that are buying vehicles sight unseen, haven't touched them. And unfortunately, COVID was a blessing in disguise for vehicle manufacturers. It taught us how to wait as consumers. It taught us to build, move to a build to order strategy. We don't see a future with 90 days of inventory on a lot anymore. We see the manufacturers going, look, here's the new plan. People are going to order it either online or at the dealer, and you dealer are going to be the person hands in the keys and be the concierge service. Really going to change the market. It's going to help the profitability of all the manufacturers as well. The China effect, it's not if, it is when they're coming to North America. They're coming, and they're going to come with a full force uh, electric vehicle. Electrification is good in some cases, is bad in others. It reduces labor. It reduces parts, therefore reduces suppliers. It reduces and reduces and reduces. When you're a volume-based supplier looking for more volume with better pricing, and electrification comes along, and the manufacturer can be more profitable per vehicle, but less vehicles, they will build less vehicles. They just care about the profitability side. It's not a bad thing. That's how the company companies are run. But that really hurts the supplier that's full volume weighted. So you really got to pay attention to your product mix, how it's, how it's shifting. Uh, again, the supply chain is changing. You got to look at secondary and tertiary. We saw it with chips. You can't put all your eggs in, in one basket in Taiwan. You have to diversify. So we're going to see this idea of maybe a, 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 a modified just-in-time model coming in where you have secondary and, and tertiary models. Existing players, GM and Ford, they are looking at the partnership. GM and Honda can build products together. Ford and uh, Volkswagen can build products together. Stellantis going from the old FCA behind in CO2 to a leader in it. And the new players. Look, I know we joke about it, but all you need is a nice uh, uh, AutoCAD drawing, a bunch of SPAC money, and a charismatic leader. And you're now a electric vehicle manufacturer uh, builder. So it's a really difficult time for suppliers to go, what's new, what's what's viable, what's not viable? Who should we invest in our backyard? Who should we bring in in economic development, things of that nature? And how do we reconfigure our product portfolio to either to stay in our lane of our manufacturing capability, but still look into this future? So this idea of proactive planning, is couldn't be more important. The reactive manufacturer or supplier or jurisdiction is going to be left in the dust if they're waiting for that stuff to come to their door. Again, a lot of people are trying to look at North America. Some that were built vehicles before and they want to get here. And they're going to need a supplier to hold their hand. So back to my example of China leveraging disruption into success. This is our new bottom. This is the time where you need to do the same thing. This disruption could create a significant amount of opportunity and you really got to pay attention to how it's going to work. So my name is Joe McCabe again, and I really thank you for your time. And Joe, we thank you. We thank you for your time and, and, and your input on this. Obviously, that is a, a fast changing landscape, a lot of disruption, but as you rightly point out, some tremendous opportunities uh, within that, whether whether that's for traditional players still eking out um, um, space for, for ICE or indeed, of course, across this changing business model for electrification. There's a few points in the Q&A that I want to I want to pick pick out uh, and drill down with you just a little bit more. Uh, the first is really this, this shift from volume to value. And I think you, you made the point uh, taking North America, 16, 2016 level, 17.8. No need to get back there, really, the, mm -hmm. at least from the, some of those OEM perspective. But what I want to kind of get a sense from you is, um, does that also inevitably bring some 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 tough pain to to either volume low margin volume players who don't convert in time or even or, or across the supply chain um, because clearly we can see high profits from some car makers who've been able to make that switch um, and I'm not sure if, if every supplier can move with them in your view is is there is there kind of pain to come in that shift from volume to value uh, absolutely uh, again you know we, we work with a lot of suppliers that really say hey here's a global platform we make a common part let's call it a a handle or a doorknob or a window or a mirror, whatever it is. Uh, some parts will stay in perpetuity. All the cars are going to need interiors and things of that nature. But if it's powertrain related and things like that, it's 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 difficult for these manufacturers that aren't really looking at their manufacturing capability and saying, well, I work in metal and I bend it or I shape it or I, I mold it. How can I now turn that piston manufacturing into something that maybe is cooling for a battery tray or things of that nature? So this idea of creativity is really important because it's coming. Now, with that said, you know, like you said, volume-based, these manufacturers, 
we have seen it. Stock market, I mean, the last couple months has really been painful because of all the global issues, but the stock market has been really rewarding manufacturers based on what they're about to be in the future, not what they are today. So they make an announcement of electrification and they can, uh, their, their stock market responds. Now, add COVID in it. COVID, a lot less vehicles are sold, a lot less vehicles were produced. Stock market went up on these manufacturers because shareholders said, hey, value per car is up. The idea of profitability is up. If I can get there with less vehicles, it's a win-win as a manufacturer. I have less vehicles to service. Got, you know, if there's any recalls, less to pay extra money on. And I'm making more per vehicle. So I can actually reduce my production footprint. So if this is this ripple effect. This is not, you know, hey, a recession we're coming out of and business as usual. Now everyone fight for the same customer. You got a different kind of consumer, but you have a different type of product. The EVs will last longer. Um, you know, th th there's a lot of negatives for the powertrain players, but yeah, this value side really has to be taken into consideration because we're not going to get back to this NASA volume uh, to play perspective. Mm. I, I wonder if we also, uh, the potential of a kind of hard landing in economic terms, obviously we see this rising inflation, interest rates going up, trying to find that balance, tough to do. On the automotive side, the input costs we know are going up, particularly if we look at areas like the battery we saw a slide yesterday that showed, I think, battery costs could, on average right now, if you added them up, probably have trebled or something like that if you if you take in all the input costs. Mm -hmm. Can it can the golden egg get, get cooked, so to speak, um, in, in terms of pushing this too far until the consumer, even in these new business models, just sort of says no, and then and then we feel the pain. Yeah, I mean that, that's the that's the that's the problem we see right this second. Everything you just said is is hitting the nail on the head about this idea of Costs go up, things go up. You can't constantly push that cost on the consumers and the vehicle manufacturers can't constantly push on the suppliers, right? It's it, there's only so much to give on margin when it comes to supplier or it's usually raised within margins. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of risk in this going forward. The concern we have is it's becoming a too big to fail strategy, tens of billions of dollars with governmental support and environmental support. There's so many stakeholders in the conversation. This isn't just, you know, hey, let's let's throw an EV out there and see if it sticks. It's we're going to throw an EV out here and we're going to satisfy a bigger government or we're going to satisfy a larger environmental push here. And we pull back on that. Now, are we are we seen as are we seen as anti-environmental? Are we seen as anti-future? And, you know, the new EVs are really leveraging this going, hey, we've never built a vehicle before, but we can do it, too. We can go 3D print ourselves something really nice and, and no powertrain needed. So great. I'll go buy some motors, some wheels and be off my, on our way. So this idea of this balance of the legacy players who have a lot of cost structure and a lot of things to worry about because they have volume and people and, and jurisdictions and these new players coming in with none of that. Uh, and they're handed two billion dollars to say, go and run with this thing. Uh, yeah, we are. Th this is what keeps us up at night about how <clears throat> is this thing going to have that hard landing? Unfortunately, or unfortunately, depending on where you play in the space, mm -hmm. they can't allow it to have a hard landing. They're going to find any way they can do to force this down the proverbial throat of the consumer to get it to work. Uh, or these companies are in real, real financial bad shape. So that's the problem we're having right now. It's not just new product at five by night. It's here to stay electrification. Just mm. how 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 long it's going to take to full convert is going to be. We believe it's decades. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, that that's a fascinating, disruptive, perhaps even disturbing view. But again, as we are, there's lots of positives within that. One of them, I mean, what you what you showed is really remarkable. How quickly, in fact, a manufacturer can 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 come off come off the starting blocks. Honda. Yeah kind of from zero to hero, as you anticipate, in, in a matter of years. Of course, behind the scenes there, the partnership with GM on, on the battery and Ultium, um, no doubt kind of setting them up for that. But that ability to come out of the starting block so fast is, is something I also think we've rarely seen. Do you think that that sort of at least bodes well, or at least can, you know, some positive signals for the, the players who are a little bit behind the curve? Um, they, if they get moving now, they may still be able to be in this race. Absolutely. I, I, it's either going to be some chemistry that pulls it off, some new technology, some innovation. I believe, yeah, this is not, this race is nowhere near uh, over. Like I said, next month, I, we may change and GM comes with an announcement, go, they're going to convert this plant 100% to EV again. And now we have to put them, have belief behind it and say, well, maybe now they're second, if not first. So, you know, at the end of the day, 
Uh, being, you know, we've always seen in the past being first doesn't mean you're always the best at all times. There are a bunch of people, Honda, the, the Asian-based manufacturer love it. They sit in the weeds and they wait and they learn and they digest and they see what works and what doesn't work and says, great, we're going to come out and we're going to come out this product. They didn't work on this stuff for a decade, if not more. They just didn't see the need to push it so hard. But the China influence forcing new energy vehicles, you have to play there. The California influence, right? You, you got to look at these new players. Of, yeah, they're, it's going to be a constant horse race. It's not a significant amount of volume. So all someone has to do is add 50,000 units to their viability story, and they they can move up three, three parts of ranking. So it's, um, yeah, we think that there is not a need to be number one. Uh, and yet we have not determined that number one has been picked yet. It's going to be constantly fluid. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Just, just I know we're running slightly over time, but I might just, just grab you for a minute or two more whilst you're here. The, um, the platform analysis, which is one of my favorite things that, that you, you guys do over in at AFS. It's just always so interesting to, to look and see how that, that compares. But clearly, I think, I'm not sure that uh, that was top in 43 odd countries. If we look to China a bit more, and I'm not asking for the, line by line detail, but broadly speaking, um, is the mix different? I mean, is there we likely to see sort of more pure EV platforms kind of running ahead, partly because, as you pointed out, at 57 percent of the volume, it's, it's such a bigger scale. Um, or in fact, do we still see quite a lot of flexible architectures um, uh, also across China? We're going to see a lot of pure EV players out there specifically because the government is forcing them to say, if you got to go EV, this is what you need to do. I mean, you have a country that uh, when they have a zero COVID policy forces their workers to sleep at the facility. You don't see that a lot in any of the countries in the world, right? So you have a very global, you have very a governmental dominated force to make sure they're going to be dominating this on a global scale. So you're going to see much more investment in these dedicated electrification. I mean, the case of point, I said BYD was doing both. Lily makes a decision as of March, hey, we're going full electric. They turn the lights off and they're going full electric at that point. So it's really interesting how they're the driving factor behind them in that in that jurisdiction is more of a uh, do it or else kind of conversation. So you're going to see more dedicated platforms that come out of it that are full battery electric. And then maybe just last point, you know, we, we, we saw the news actually just just earlier this week or last week kind of confirming. Fisker working with with Foxconn. You you, you showed you showed on on the slide there some uh, some scope there as well. But do you see do you see more scope for this contract manufacturing uh, in the, whether in the North America or European context um, for some of these new players? Uh, uh, new and legacy, honestly. Mm -hmm. Contract manufacturing. If you can build a, a you can make your skateboard design of the EV the platform a commodity. Let's call it and the value add is the top hat you put on with someone else's badges and you can find a way to really cut the cost that way because that's most of your cost is that battery and then infrastructure of that of that skateboard oh yeah absolutely i mean i see players and i'm not you know i see the magnets of the world who are experiencing this right the pinaferinas like these are these companies that know how to contract manufacture and i can really see that their 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 expertise is going to be brought to the forefront uh you're going to see a lot more because that's the only way you're going to fill these plants Got to justify the existence of these plants and their and their, uh, their footprint and their labor pool. And it's not going to be building 250,000 of one vehicle. It's going to be building five different sets of 50 uh, for, for different customers under the same underpinnings and same commonality of build. So this is certainly one of the ways that the industry will, will, will ma partly manage the value over volume de decreases in scale, That's mm -hmm. which it still obviously depends on. Joe, as ever, fascinating. Really appreciate all this insight for our audience. We will share the, the presentation. Uh, it'll be available in the platform for those watching it on, on demand. But we want to thank you again and look forward to, as ever, keeping up with you, bringing you on again in the future to, for these updates. We, we always enjoy it, and it's always full of insight. Thank you, Chris. Same here. Great audience, great venue. So uh, good luck with the rest of your conference, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, Joe. And to our audience, again, uh, just a reminder, as, as, as mentioned, the, we'll, we'll upload the platform, uh, sorry, the, the a PDF of that presentation for you to absorb that data. Um, in the meanwhile, we'll take a short break, but in 10 minutes, we're right back here for uh, a session on flexible automation. So you don't want to miss that. You'll find it right on the agenda. We'll see you real soon.